Change is one of the greatest challenges confronting humanity, and Nigeria has its fair share of the challenge. So on this week's edition of The Facts, I decided to go in search of a climate and environmental scientist, an award-winning one at that, a professor of meteorology, and a recipient of the United States Government's Outstanding Scholar Award. My guest on The Facts this week is the fourth substantive vice chancellor of Olusha Gwaga, University of Science and Technology, Okitipupa. We will be looking at diverse things, including climate change, university administration, and of course, the black man and its relevance in the global space. Welcome to the program. My name is Akemumi Abodunde. Let's join Professor Temi Emmanuel Ologunorisha on today's edition of The Facts. Thank you once again for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> All right. Um, I'd like to begin with the fact that you are a recipient of the United States Government's Extraordinary Scholar Award. That sounds to me a very big thing. What does it mean to you? Uh, well, for me... Uh, Extraordinary <laughs> Scholar. <laughs> yeah. For me, it's, uh, it's just... Uh, to confirm that Africans are not that bad the way we seem to portray. Even Nigerians are not, academics are not really uh, at the bottom line in the hierarchy of knowledge, the way we tend to portray it. Because I grew up in this country, I had my primary school, secondary school, university education, whether it's bachelor's, master's, PhD, I became a professor in this country. But I've been working on a, on a local problem of global significance. Professor signific of meteorology. <laughs> yes, of global significance. I've worked extensively in the area of flood, climate change, but most significantly looking at flooding and drought, which are two major uh, climatic issues that confront the world. Uh, whether in the, the major environmental issues in the 21st century. So we look, I've looked at the issue of flooding over the years in the different basins, whether Niger Delta, Benue Basin, Oshun River Basin, and several basins in Nigeria. Uh, but the major highlight is that the world has been able to recognize my work because I published some of my findings uh, in leading journals around the world. And, uh, and I've also served as consultant to UNESCO, to World Bank, to some oil companies, and even to British Council. So for me, uh, the award is just to encourage, it's just like an encouragement to say, oh, so we are not as bad. So because it was, it was on the basis of my scholarship and my research accomplishment that got me the award. I'll come to research, but yes. I must first of all say that I'm, I'm excited that, yes. you know, a professor of meteorology at the Federal University of Technology. Thank, thank you very uh, much. That's, that, that's where I graduated from. Oh, actually. fantastic. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's go to, uh, to the key issues. Okay. Before we come to the challenge of climate change, mm. it's exciting also that um, a Nigerian was recognized in 2018 mm. by the United States government yes. on the issue of climate change, which is on the front burner mm. of world reckoning. Very many other Nigerians, a, a good number of other Nigerians, are also doing fantastic things all over the world. But we do not seem to be seeing the impact in our own country. Niger maybe that's what we call, we should say, something like the Yoruba say, that um, Adarani, Tama, Adarani, is that the situation? What exactly is the problem? Nigerians are doing well all over the world. Yet, our country is going down the ladder. Yeah. What's the problem? Yeah, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of issues to look at here. First, when you look at the Nigerian university system, mm -hmm. because every country has a system, we have the American university system, we have the Nigerian university system, we have the South African university system. Our university system has a weak linkage with the industry. And we also have a weak linkage with government. We have weak linkage even with NGOs and international organizations. 
And of course, the town and gun relationship. Relationship, yeah. So, uh, university in the, in the developed world, they are, universities are established to solve societal problems. In the developed world, even in South Africa, that is even in Africa, mm. there's a strong linkage between the industry and the university. Universities are supposed to be solving problems coming from the industry. There's no, there's, there's, there's weak linkage. And then most of the research findings in our universities, they are more theoretical, they end up in the, in the bookshelves. They are not translated into products. Whose fault? <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's the fault of the researchers, the government. There should be an enabling framework. So why is that enabling framework not in place? Yeah, when you also look at uh, government policy, it has to be deliberate. There must be deliberate and conscious effort to bring about this marriage. It's not just, uh, it, must be, it must be policy driven. Government must encourage that. And universe, the way it goes is this. Industry is supposed to provide funds. We provide funds to say, these are the problem we have in the industries. University, those who researchers who are experts in that area, come and provide solution. There's fund. So in other words, Sometimes researches in the universities are not funded by government, but they could be funded by, by industries. Industry will tell, us, will tell uh, academics, this is where we are having problems, and they will provide funds. The same thing with government. You see a lot of government issues. Now we are talking about narrow devaluation, narrow sliding. This government has not engaged academics. Prof, you have you've touched a very sore point. Now, it looks to me like we are, as a nation, we are not intentional about anything. That is true. What exactly do you think? Because you're a leader in the system. Yeah. I'm not just talking of the academia. Yeah. I'm talking of the Nigerian system. System, of course. Why are we not intentional about anything? Well, uh, when you look at over the years, we have, we've had several successive governments. Some have been successful, some have not been too successful. But I want to say that we are where we are because we've not been using the right people. The right, uh, we've not been using the right people, putting the, what is it, the uh, round, round pegs in round holes. We have so many intellectuals, bureaucrats, technocrats in this government, in this country, over 200 million. Well, for God's sake, what is the role of a youth copper as a minister? Mm. Or somebody that just left, left university, no experience, nothing. You know, we're not serious as a country. Uh, in the developed world, they, bring, they look for the best to solve a problem. There will be a solution. So well, our policy makers, who are the politicians, they have not been looking in the right direction. So there's no con conscious and deliberate effort. And it has to be driven by politicians, policy makers. Policy makers are the politicians who dictate the, director, the direction of planning. Okay. Yes. Now, let, let, let's look at um, this scenario. Yeah. Prof Nigerian professionals abroad yes. are doing well. Fantastic. But looks like they are not exporting their professional capacities to their country. Now, government, we all know that government may not be doing well enough, and that's the general opinion mm. of people in the, in the country. But Nigerian professionals who are doing fantastic things abroad do not seem to also be intentional about exporting their professional capacities and content back home. Why? Well, I, I will say... I must say, I'm, I'm, I must commend you, despite all the things you have done on the global scale, you decided to come back home yeah. to, you know, um, impart knowledge and provide, you know, uh, content for in, in your area of special, specialization. But not many Nigerian professionals abroad would do that. Why? Yeah. Uh, although we have the Diaspora Commission yes. uh, established by government, which is also a deliberate attempt to bring uh, Nigerians who are doing well in the Diaspora here, but when you look at it, the enabling environment is not there. I've had conversations with several people in the U.S. They want to come home. There's a challenge of security, electricity. The basic needs of life are not there. And that's a major challenge. 
and uh, also patriotism too. When you look at the Chinese, even the Indians, when they were looking for a way to develop, they went to America, went to Massachusetts, Stanford, Harvard. They stole their technology and went back home. Mm. That's is, is, because there's a, there's a connection. But most of our people, sometimes, once they are over there, sometimes, and they become citizens, they don't even want to identify with uh, Nigeria again, maybe mm. a small fraction. But I think we should not give up on them. The enabling environment to, to practice what they have learned is not there. There are no equipment, there are no basic existence of life, uh, security kidnapping, all those kind of things. And some of these issues are magnified even over there. So mm. they became terrified. They can't come. Sometimes when I was home, they said, where do you want to go and do over there? I earned good money in the U.S. When I came here, <laughs> I'm not sure I earned up to $1,000, but I'm happier here because I'm solving problems and I'm putting smile on the faces of people which you cannot quantify in money. Several of them in this diaspora too are also eager. They want to come home, actually. I know of one recently retired voluntarily in the U.S., Professor Jimmy Adegoke. He's just 60 years old from the University of Missouri. He said he wants to come back home and give back to the society. He wants to see how he can use his uh, exposure, his experience to, to get grants, to see how he can use it to solve problems and transform the Nigerian and the African landscape. But... When we had a reception for him, most of the people were just looking at him. Is this man crazy? <laughs> you know, but he was convinced. So several of them are interested in coming, but I think the enabling environment at home is not too palatable. And then two, government must be receptive at creating an enabling environment to allow these people to come. Like the Indians and the Chinese, there's, it's, there's, there was a deliberate effort. Those that were sent out, they came back. Even the remittances, even from those countries, is so high. Mm. The, the Western culture has, has not been able to change their, the way of life. The Indians, despite the fact that we were both colonized Nigeria, by British, use their culture, their dressings have not changed. But for us, I don't know for whatever reasons, when we get over there, sometimes we get westernized and sometimes forget our route. But there are a few chunks of them who are interested in coming back. But the, the fear is, where would they start from? Okay, let's go to something else um, that is also, you know, slightly related okay. to uh, our conversation since we started this program. You are executive director of the Center for Black um, Understanding and Black Culture, Black, Black Culture and, and International, International Understanding. Understanding. Yeah, that is of true. course, affiliated to UNESCO. UNESCO, yeah. What's the place of the black man in global reckoning? Uh, well, black man, for us... The, I'm sorry. Yeah. A lot of people believe that the black man has a slavish mentality. Do mm. you share that perspective? Well, it's a misfeeling. Uh, when I look at the American history, there was civil war. Is it civil war? Yeah, there was civil war. In, uh, in 1787 or 1776 before the independence, uh, not only the white fought the British, even the blacks. In fact, what led to the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln was because blacks who went to the war, they, they were stronger than the whites. It was even then that the blacks discovered that so, so they are not inferior. To this, to this black. To the uh, whites. To the whites. And when they came back from the, after the war, there were riots all over the place. They discovered that these people are, they are not superior. Let me put it that way. It's like the, the, the consciousness came onto them, even though they were slaves. And that made Abraham Lincoln to say, oh, there's emancipation proclamation, free, no, no slavery again. So Africa. Every American citizen is free. Yes, all the African slaves. The African American, they are, they are free. So that made him to, to, to give that proclamation. So Africans are not inferior in any way. When you get to the US, get to America, most of the good places, inventions are by blacks. Blacks, when I say blacks, 
whether Af whether Africa, Af blacks in, in Africa or in, in different parts of the world. Africans are not inferior. It's just the enabling environment. But I don't know why uh, sub-Saharan Africa, really, is like I don't know what happened. The whole continent, apart from South Africa and some pockets of area in North Africa, the sub-Saharan Africa is completely backward. But I don't believe that Africans are inferior because I have a colleague he had his first degree in Nigeria, master's in Nigeria. He had a PhD in Canada. He's a president of Illinois State University. Mm. Taoli, Andover. He's a thief guy from Benue State. He had his first degree from JOS, MSc JOS, PhD in McMaster University. He rose through the rank, through hard work. It's not easy to be, but that's a vice chancellor. Mm -hmm. Illinois State University. Go and Google it. The Nigerians are... They are working in Harvard as professors. They are not inferior. I think it has to do with the environment and, and the poverty of the mind. Mm. Yes. Africans are not inferior. The white, they recognize that. We, we are not inferior. Maybe uh, that is the kind of colonial uh, mentality. But Africans in diaspora who have, who have traveled far and wide, they are doing well. In Britain, they are, they are doing great exploits. And I've seen Africans, doctors who are working at uh, John Hopkins University, which is the best medical school in the US. In Massachusetts, you see Nigerians who are uh, lecturers. You see uh, Harvard, Stanford, the Ivy League universities. Nigerians litter the whole place. And they are doing great work. So, <laughs> in fact, the white people don't believe the Africans are, are inferior. We are the one looking at ourselves as inferior to the whites. Professor Lubonisha, you are a Yoruba man, yeah. a Nigerian, so properly called. Mm. Do you see hope for this country? Of course. I see I'm not saying you should talk to me as a patriotic Nigerian. <laughs> I want you to speak to me and speak to the viewer with every sense of sincerity. Seriously, Do you yeah. see hope for Nigeria? Mm. Uh, social scientists will say the only thing permanent in life is change. We are going through a phase. That's what I feel. We are going through a phase. But I don't know how long... Have we not been on this phase for too long? <laughs> yes. That is the only thing. We don't know the gestation period for this phase. For this phase. Even those countries we cherish today, they have also gone through this phase. America has, has 200 years of democracy. So it's a phase. Yeah, it's a phase. And uh, we, with right leadership, our problem is more of leadership. We keep talking about right leadership. And the followership Can too. we <laughs> never get right lead, leadership right? Can we never get it right with leadership? Yes. Uh, the process through which leaders emerge in this mm. part of the world is as a problem. It's very faulty. In the Western world, for instance, I will still start America. The American system, when you look at their constitution, I've looked at their constitution, the requirements to become a president is that you must have a degree, advanced degree. It's called advanced degree. Although the advanced degree, they call it is our bachelor's because they have associate degree, which is like a, non, a diploma. Uh, and then or JD, which is Juris Doctor. It's either you are a lawyer or you have an advanced degree, which is a graduate. A graduate. Not only that, then the American society themselves, they have a picture, they have a dream of who a president should look like. It's either you have served in the army, like a veteran, or in most cases, you have attended top universities, Ivy League universities. Because Ivy League universities, that's in their own mentality, their own culture. It's either your parents are rich or you are brilliant. In most mm. cases, brilliant. Harvard is $62,000. How many people who can afford that in a year? So they want to look at the kind of school you have attended. And then you must have accomplishment. So it's that you have gone to Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Massachusetts, Michigan, California, you know, top schools. But we don't have any defined standard. We don't have a defined standard. And they look at your pedigree they, they, in terms of accomplishment and even in your integrity. But here, we don't have any criteria. The requirement is... School starts, and the school starts, it is not, not even one credit, two credit, just attempted school starts. 
Most of the time, I think that, um, or well, a lot of people believe that most of the time the criteria is that you have a lot of money. Yeah, that is what I'm saying, that the process through which leaders emerge in Nigeria and maybe other parts of Africa is faulty, unlike the Western world that have got it right. Leadership is a, is a major issue. So here it's about money. If you have money, nobody cares about how you got the money. Once you have money, you can drive anything. And then two, one other thing that is very, that is very jammy to our development, which has been keeping us down, is that there is no rule of law. There's no rule of law. The law is meant for the poor or whatever. In overseas, for the first time in my life, I didn't know a military man could be arrested for driving one way. That's the truth. A policeman arrested a, a military person and he had to pay fine. In fact, higher fine. So nobody is above the law. The law is the, is the starting point. We don't have law here. The rule of law is not really in operation So here. there's no discipline? There's no discipline. There's no rule of law. That's the starting point. Once there's a rule of law, everybody is conscious that whatever position you are occupying, you can, you can, you can be tried. You can go to jail. A, a professor teaching a student in the U.S., once you, give, you, you assign a course, you get to the class, you give a syllabus to the student. What is the syllabus? It's not just the course description. You tell the student, this is the way I'm going to grade you, what they call the rubrics. Uh, exam is this, number of tests, this is this. Everything will be clearly stipulated. The number of tests, the number of assignments, everything over 100. The number of times you have to be in class and reading materials. Once you give that to the student in the first class, there's already a contract. If you go outside that, the lecturer can lose his job because the student can go to court. Mm. It's a litigious society. Everybody knows it's right. But here, a lecturer comes to the class. He doesn't even know that he has a social contract with the student. Mm. He comes and uh, anything goes. So rule of law is very vital. And the leadership, the process through which leaders are recruited. It's very forced. We need to re-examine it. We need to interrogate it. I have been speaking with Professor Temi Emmanuel Ologun, the Vice Chancellor Olusegun Agagu, University of Science and Technology, Okitipupa. He's also a professor of meteorology and climate, and, science. And climate <laughs> science. Professor Ologun, thank you very much for speaking to me. We'll take a break at this point. We'll return shortly. Please stay with us. It's still the fact. Thank you very much for staying with us on this edition of The Facts. My guest is Professor Temi Emmanuel Ologunrusha, the fourth substantive vice chancellor of Olusegun Agagu University of Science and Technology, Okitipupa. Prof, thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's go to your area of professional training. Thank you very and much. And that is climate science and meteorology. One of the biggest problems globally is climate change. And um, recently, we saw a huge impact of climate change, especially in the Borno State area of Nigeria. But first of all, are you satisfied with the global attention that climate change is receiving, especially the politics around the issue of climate change? Are you satisfied on the one hand, and are you worried on the other hand? Yeah, uh, let me say, start by saying that uh, uh, what is happening around the world, including Nigeria, is the reality that the climate is, is changing and it's man-induced, really. And it's also an indication that Nigeria, we need to plan for disaster. We don't plan dis for disaster. We need to build mm. disaster into our developmental agenda. We don't wait for disaster to come. We need to build it. We need to prepare because nobody can stop disaster. You can only mitigate disaster. So for climate issues around the world, where uh, for us in the developing country, in the south, we call it the south, I'm not too satisfied because the part of the Paris Agreement was that the developed world should provide some fund, mitigation funds or adaptation funds for developing countries that are not really industrialized and uh, who are also uh, on the receiving end of this climate anomaly, climate catastrophe, you can call it. But of course, 
The developing countries themselves, too, they are not happy matters. Some of them, even when they go to the World International Climate Change Summit. Arena or Summit, they don't send the right people. <laughs> Sometimes government people who attend, or they are not experts. And they don't carry people who are experts along for them mm -hmm. to be able to negotiate correctly on what... Uh, you mean uh, the developing countries? Developing countries, okay. yeah. They need to, to, they need to speak louder. And, uh, so that they can have a good bite at the charity. Bargaining, yes, at the international arena. And uh, not only that, uh, the developing countries, they also have to look at these policies very well. Uh, first, like I've said, the climate change is a global issue. Even America has its own, the rich also cry. Mm -hmm. But they build, they build uh, disaster management into their, into their plans into their budget, into their plan. Look at here in Nigeria. In 2012, there was killer floods. It's not just, just happening. Mm -hmm. They set up Dangote foundations, whatever. I mean, how much of that money collected was put into research? Mm -hmm. This flood is not just happening. 2012, in recent, the last decade or two, whatever. 2012, 2017, 18, ben, the whole of Benue was submerged. Part of the money was probably stolen. Well, maybe not... Or mismanaged. Well, I won't say that. Or not used for the right purpose. Yeah, yes, it's, it's a matter of prioritization. There was, as of today, we don't have a center of research for flooding, for flood forecasting and prediction. Despite the fact that we know that we have that challenge. Challenge. If you go to China or whatever, they have hurricane research center. They, even in America, they have hurricane research center. They have drought research center. Even though they have national agency like NIMET, whatever, it goes beyond that. They have agencies, tornado research center, earthquake research center. Specifics. Specifics. We don't have a drought research center. We don't have flood research center. And we keep having problem of flood. All this issue could be addressed. So these are issues. So it's, it's not just about, we don't plan. We don't, what are you, yes. these stakeholders, doing? Because... In my opinion, and I hate to say this, the strategic stakeholders, including you, yeah. are no, are, may not be doing enough to drive conversation in that direction. Why? Well, we, <laughs> people like us, people in academia, we engage uh, these policymakers. We, Intensely? We, yeah, we, we, we bring them for engagement on conferences and whatever. But when you look at it too, you, I attended a program recently by the Town Planning Society of Nigeria, Town Planning Associations. I was a lead speaker to speak to them. They brought the governor of data state, was head at Asaba last year. The governor came and some other top government functionaries. After the opening ceremony, they left. Not listening to the so real the, issues. Read, I don't told those guys that they are, the conference is already a failure. That the, that Rather than uh, uh, giving, uh, what is it called, uh, goodwill messages. They used about three, four hours for goodwill messages. After that, the governor declared and the man left. Opening ceremony. Opening ceremonies. That the lecture should have come uh, before the, the declaration of uh, or the program of me. So sometimes uh, people in the universities, they bring them in. They bring people, policymakers in for conferences, workshops. We don't engage them enough. And two, I don't know whether it's a culture of impunity or we don't really, we, we don't tend to, we, 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 our policy, I don't know what I have to say policy, maybe it's not derived from theory. We don't bring, the, we don't bring people, you know, to assist government. We see, I would say there is a weak link. This weak linkage I've been talking about or, between universities. Or, and or could it be that those who actually are the policymakers deliberately exclude those, the people in the intelligentsia from being part of policymaking? Have yeah. you seen anything like that? Yeah, I, I want to believe that. Maybe, maybe poverty of ideas or whatever. I know that Babangida's government 
whether anybody likes or it's one of the government that actually used intelligence here. Yeah. And it was quite successful, apart from the annulment of June 12. That government is very successful. And uh, even the one regime, they also use a, a lot of intelligence here. And uh, even Obasanjo government, in fact, use a lot of intelligence here. We have Okoju Enwela, you have uh, Magnus Capo, um, Paco, OBS, uh, Kwesili, several of them, Shah Soludo. You know, this government has not been using intellectuals. I, Tinobu is like, it's, it's an intellectual. It's brilliant. It's a genius. But for me, his government looks like it's anti-intellectuals. Mm. How many professors are in that government? All these issues they are having about running the economy. Let them bring people from the university to assist them. Not pseudo scholars. Okay, let's come to Olusegun Gagu University of Science and Technology. Thank you very much. You are the fourth substantive vice chancellor, mm -hmm. and at the beginning of this program, you talked about the Ivy League universities abroad. Can universities in Nigeria, including yours, OAU Tech, get to the climb to the ladder or climb to the level of the Ivy League universities abroad? Well, uh, every university has its, has its own vision and mission. At our own stage of development now, we can't say we want to be, we can't be, we can't be there. We, our aspiration is to be there. Mm. Just like Nigeria, you say, oh, are we, are, are we like... Are we intentional about going there? Yes, we are intentional about going there. It may take a little time, but we are on a journey. It's, we are on a track. As a nation or as... As, as a university. As a university. Yes, as a university. Of course, you cannot divorce the society from the university. Uh, university is supposed to provide direction for the society. Uh, as a university, we have a blueprint to leapfrog this university mm. into that trajectory of becoming a world-class university. We have, for the first time, we have what is called a uh, strategy plan which we have developed for the university. 10 year strategy plan that covers various structural. Okay, that we the, even outlive your administration. That you outlive my administration. So whoever is coming, because that is part of the challenges we have in Nigeria. Each successive government comes with its own vision. There is no continuity. Mm. So we have put this university on a trajectory and we don't want anybody to come around and dislodge it and start all over again. No. You want somebody who will come over and build because the people were, uh, were actually involved in developing the strategic plan. What are the things you have done in concrete terms? I mean, the ABC of the strategies you have put in place to ensure that this university is on a proper trajectory to excellence. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, when I came on board in this, uh, to this university, uh, there were a lot of challenges. Staff were on half salary. Even the half salary they were earning, they were holding there for about four months. The remaining half, they were holding them for three years. Staff who work in this university, who retired, nobody was ever paid any entitlement. Mm. Those who died in the course of their career, nobody remembered them. Mm. Staff were promoted severally, nobody pays them for the areas of promotion or even implementing the so-called promotion. And uh, even students, students graduated for nine months, they could not be mobilized for youth service because they have a software for processing student results. A staff would develop it, resign, and it went away with it. So the university was completely down. Paralyzed. Paralyzed. Those who graduated in 2021, to be specific, August, they could not be mobilized until around March when I came. Even student resort for two, three years, I need that process or whatever. So it was like a collapse system. I paid a visit to the DSS, and they told me that, young man, you have to move fast, that the university is sitting on, on top of a gunpowder, that the place will slow, that you have to move fast. Initially, it didn't down on me <laughs> until one day because there was student strike. There was there was strike by ASU, and the university was shut down. You know, until one day, 
some group of students carry placard and they came to meet me in the office that they have not been mobilized for youth service. But they call, to call the story short, today we have liquidated the three years that we have for salaries. We have paid the four months outstanding. All areas of uh, st staff who died in the system have been paid, their relations. Those who retired have been paid fully. Even principal officers who work here, they were never paid. We've paid them. It's as bad as that. Students graduate at the right time. Even this university, for 15 years, there was no convocation. We have instituted a, a culture. We had our first convocation last year. Uh, is it last? Yes, we had another one this year, March 4, every year. Things are, are working. We pay our salary now every 22nd to 25th of the month. In terms of the quality of knowledge yeah. that the students get, what have you done differently? Yeah, uh, we will be able to link this university with some of, as a university, you cannot. You can't do it alone because of uh, challenges of facilities and whatever. We'll be able to forge partnership and collaborations with some leading universities around the world. We have collaboration with uh, Capina University in uh, Brazil. We have collaborations, linkage we have signed with the uh, University of Missouri in the US, where I, I was actually a visiting professor before I came here. We also have collaboration with Auburn University, in, uh, also in Alabama. And then we have a collaboration with the Caribbean Maritime University, because that one is, in fact, is so dear in my heart, because part of the vision I came, came with when I joined this university is to key this university into the new economy of the world. What is this new economy? It is the blue economy. This university is strategically located close to the coast. We're just 15 minutes away from the ocean. And the new discussion in the world now is that we have over $300 trillion of money locked up in the ocean and the coastal environment, which are untapped. So there's a new direction to look into the ocean, to look into the marine environment and tap these resources. Does Nigeria understand the blue economy di dimension to global reckoning? Of course, we have a Minister of Blue Economy, Maria Blue Economy, but you don't as sound of today, convinced. I'm not sure the ministry has got it right. The ministry has not got it right. But you're trying, as a university, you're yes. trying to do something. Yeah, we have, a, we have a school of maritime transport and logistics. Prof, yes. a lot of Nigerian universities are not living up to the reasons or to the purposes for which they were established. For instance, there are very many universities of technology in Nigeria, yet Nigeria is technologically backward. It seems to me that the universities of technology are not impacting the society. Also, there are, there are mono-universities, University of Petroleum Science and all of that in Efro, and, and now your own that is very close to the ocean. Why is it difficult for Nigerian universities to, uh, to, to um, achieve the purpose for which they were established specifically. Yeah, let me also make, I'll make a general statement and I'll go to specific. When you also look at the way universities are being established in Nigeria, the act that empowers AUC to grant license, especially to a public university, needs to be interrogated. Mm. It's faulty. What does it require to set up a university? It's just a mere proclamation. A governor will get to a village and say, oh, I've established a university here. And then you see we issue a license. Hmm. We have reduced university education. Is it, Trivialize is it, this. Trivialize it. The purpose of university all over the world, we have to understand that. Our policymakers don't really understand. They look at it as maybe to, as a community service or so, or I don't know, you know, as... Just go to one village, no elections, and say this or that. University is to produce high-level manpower, skilled manpower, and to solve problems of the society. High-level university is not high-level manpower that will solve the problem of the society. Critical societal problems. Yes, 
Exactly. But the way universities are established, they are more political rather than academic. They are not well thought out. And so the purpose of universities in the first instance have been defeated. See some states that cannot even finance a single university. They have five universities. Five in, I don't want to mention states. We have some states, five universities, six universities, they can't fund them. They rely only on third fund. Sometimes you begin to wonder, you get to some places and say it's a university, all the buildings, 90% third fund. Most universities are like that. So, and you can't. Buildings, even generators. Generators, everything. So we have missed it. So the purpose of university is not properly understood. And uh, we tend to look at it as establishing a secondary school or whatever. And those universities will miss it. They will so not we must interrogate the act. The heart. The heart is 40. What? Especially for public universities. You for private are universities. the vice chancellors. Yes. The there's, a co there's a body called Committee of Vice Chancellors. What are you doing in that regard? Well, Committee of Vice Chancellors is like... Uh, yeah, it's a pressure group. It's a pressure group. It's a pressure group. And uh, they've make, made a lot of declarations. There's what they call the Kefi declarations on even award of honorary degrees and this or that. There have been so many policy discussions by Committee of Vice Chancellor. Whatever they say is advisory. It's just advice. Government is a liberty to say they take it or they don't take it. That's the truth. Mm. There is, there's, there is just advisory. They can just make noise. Irrespective of the quality and of content of such advice, government can actually look of away course, from it. Of course, there is impunity. If government does not listen, what, what is the consequence? It's the society that will suffer. Mm. Just like I'm look, we are talking about a lacuna in, a, in the National University Commission Act. We've, people have criticized it, we've said it severally, but uh, it's left so up. when universities are, 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 are built or established on faulty platforms, they cannot drive They the cannot purpose. fulfill their vision. Okay, I'm interested in the blue economy that you talked about that uh, Molusha Mwaga, University of Science and Technology, is pushing. How far have you gone and how far do you intend to go? Thank you very much. Uh, we have a maritime academy, like the School of Maritime Transport. And really? Logistic. Yeah. Uh, at uh, Ubonla which Ooh. is just about 25 minutes from If you know Ubo land, yes. Ubo, just a little, just within that uh, axis. axis, just about uh, one or two poles from KBSU's palace. We have a maritime academy there, which uh, is being built for us by uh, Osopadek, the Ondo State Oil Producing uh, Development yeah, Commission, or okay. thereabout. Uh, it's currently at 60 or 70 percent near completion. Uh, that academy intends to run programs in shipping, shipping and port management. Remember, the deep sea port has been approved by the federal government. Yes. We are hoping that before President Tinubu completes his tenure, that project should, should be completed. So our agenda is to produce critical manpower that will drive this economy. So the Maritime Academy is going to run bachelor's degree in shipping and port management, maritime transport and logistics, maritime security, and uh, maritime economics and finance. Mm. And as of today, we have a collaboration, an MOU, with the leading maritime university in the Caribbean. I've been there, and we have also invited them here. So we, we mean serious business. They've looked at our resources, and they have so those areas, they can assist us. Are you sure you have capacity to drive this vision? <laughs> I have the exposure. Not you. Yes. Not you as an individual. Yes. I mean the structures, the infrastructure, the financing, the political will to drive this vision that you have put in place. Do you think you have it? That is why the foundation is very strong. We have intentionally... The Ubunla, if you get to Ubunla, Ubunla, where the school is located, less than two, three minutes, you are the jetty. And we have been able to key critical stakeholders to key into this agenda. The NDDC, 
uh, our super deck, the Nigeria Port Authority, Nigeria Port Authority, we are to, uh, not even the Port Authority. We are talking about Nimasa. Mm. We are also engaging Nimasa to give us support. So there's going to be support at local, state, and national level because there are just few maritime academy in Nigeria, just one or two, one mm. at Oro. So there's a critical shortage of manpower in this area. And like I've said, we have MOU with the Caribbean Maritime University in Jamaica. They want to assist us. They are eager. You have a five-year tenure, Professor yes. Logo Risha. Um, is the structure solid enough to outlive your administration? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that is why I told you that when I came on board, the first thing I did, or we did as a management under my leadership, was to develop a 10-year strategic plan for the university. The, the maritime structure is also part it's of also that It's also part of that agenda, plan. yeah. So we have this strategic plan, and the 10 years, such that there are structures we are putting in place. And uh, those who develop the plan, they are not from our side. It's, not, it's, like, it's internally driven. So that when we leave, when I leave, and some other people, there will be continuity. Okay. As we take down this interview, yes. um, I'm also interested in the other areas of your content. Mm. I mean, the, the, the courses that you run. Yes. The quality of teachers that you have. The quality, or the, volume, the quality and volume of facilities to drive these courses. Are you on a very solid footing as a university? Yeah, let me say it. Uh, our graduates are doing very well. Two of our graduates, they made first class here. They were admitted straight for PhD in the US. One is at Ohio, one is at the University of Cincinnati. The one that made a first class in chemistry was admitted for PhD in chemical engineering. And another one is doing something in biochemistry. And they are doing well. Several of them have gotten PhD in UK and the US. Then, apart from that, we have a laboratory here. It's second to none. We have a science laboratory here. Some, one or two of our professors got a grant where they, they brought a lot of equipment from, uh, what's it called? I uh, can't remember now, from the US. And we're able to get scientists to help us assemble them. When the AUC came, they gave us letters of commendation. We have a world-class research lab, science laboratory here to train first-class graduates that can stand anywhere in the world. And uh, without standing models, we have some group of people, scholars we just hired in engineering. These are guys well-trained. One of them made a first class from Ibadan, had a master's from... Uh, uh, from the uh, from University of London, Imperial College. And they had a PhD from the University of New Zealand. We got him, got him somewhere. And uh, he's recruited as an associate professor. And we, also, we have been able to also aid hunt for some good hands in some other universities. So you're investing heavily in human capital development. Fantastic. And we, send our, we, we also put high premium on staff development. Several of our PhD students or uh, uh, or lecturers who are on PhD program, we send them abroad to Malaysia, to South Africa, few to US for what you call bench work, laboratory, uh, to do their laboratory work. Maybe I'll port to your university. <laughs> thank you very much, Professor <laughs> Timio Logorisha, for thank talking you. to yeah, me. Thank you very much. This is how far we shall go on this week's edition of The Facts. I've been speaking to the fourth substantive vice chancellor of the Lushe Gwagagu University of Science and Technology, Professor Temi Imano Lugorisha. And we've looked at very, very many areas of critical national development, including the academics and technological development, as well as the place of the black man. Thank you very much for being a part of the facts this week. Let's do this again next week. My name is Akimu Miyabadude. Please enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe.